Good evening. I'm Jessica Degancic, Vice President of Events for the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, and we are so thrilled that you are joining us for tonight's discussion on city diplomacy and LA's relationship with Korea and East Asia with Ambassador Nina Hashigian, Deputy Mayor for International Affairs for the City of Los Angeles. Today's discussion will be moderated by Eric Mobrand, Korea Policy Chair and a Senior Political Scientist at the RAND Corporation. I would also like to thank our webinar sponsor, the Korea Foundation, for their support of our programs. For our audience, we'll be taking your questions in about 35 minutes. You can submit your questions by entering them on the control panel, which is on the right-hand side of your screen under the question section. And I will get to as many of your questions as I can when we get to the question portion. Ambassador Hashigian and Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll turn this conversation over to you. And as I mentioned, we'll join back in about 35 minutes with some questions from our audience. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Jessica. <clears throat> uh, Ambassador Hashigian, it's an honor to uh, share the stage with you here today. There's uh, really so much dynamism in cities on either side of the Pacific. I've spent, uh, I'm, I'm working at Rand there in LA now, but I've spent much of the last five years in Seoul, Korea, and it's a place that has a really high level of uh, energy. Um, and it's a city that has many connections to Los Angeles as well. I think uh, the the cast of Squid, Squid Games has been in town the last few few days as at least uh, one indicator of these uh, these connections that we have that many people are aware of. Uh, this popular culture from Korea is, of course, something that's getting uh, a lot of attention um, uh, in the United States and other places overseas coming from Seoul. And uh, programs like that have made us all aware of the, the television series, the, the films, the music industry in Korea, um, and uh, they have produced hits that, that have achieved the acclaim of, uh, of Hollywood standards in recent years. And I feel that from, from living in Seoul, I feel that some of the positive energy that many people around the world associate with Los Angeles and California is now coming to, to Seoul and Korea uh, as well. Uh, today, we can talk about some of the connections and parallels between LA and the megacities in Asia, such as uh, Seoul. First, though, I thought we would take some time uh, to discuss uh, your role. Now, Ambassador Hashigan, you are the inaugural holder of this uh, Deputy Mayorship of International Affairs for Los Angeles. What a title. Uh, the title alone uh, suggests that this is uh, an innovative initiative. Um, and as the former ambassador to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, you would seem like the ideal person to take up this, this role. So I, I guess I'd like to ask you to tell us a little bit about uh, what, this, what this position is, as it's a new one, I think, to many of us. Sure, um, and thank you. And uh, thank you to the to World Affairs Council Town Hall and um, uh, to the Korea uh, Foundation as well for, um, for this event. And very nice to meet you uh, also. Um, so I think I am, well, I'm definitely the first deputy mayor for international affairs in Los Angeles. I think um, I'm the only one in the country at the moment um, that I know of. Uh, it's interesting that in other cities around the world, it's not it's not so unusual as it is here in, in, Los, in, in the United States. We can talk more about that later. Um, so basically, we you know with a city as global as los angeles is um and i think probably many of many of the viewers on this call know know about that but for those who may not you know we're we're a, we're a city of four million and a county of uh 10 million and a kind of an urban area of 18 million um we um have the third busiest airport in the world before covid the biggest container port in the Western Hemisphere and huge diaspora populations from places like Korea and many others where we are, uh, you know, the, the largest diaspora population outside their home country for many and, and for many others, the largest in the United States. Um, we have uh, 60, we have about 100 consulates uh, in Los Angeles, so 67 kind of official diplomats and then the others are, are honorary consulates. Um, 
and of course, many uh, industries that are global in nature. So uh, for a city that's this global, um, and given that there is a big world out there of ideas and employers and markets, uh, culture, visitors, relatives, friends, if we aren't reaching out globally and engaging with partners around the world, then I don't, we're not doing right by our residents. So uh, we, we have this position in, in my office now um, in order to best serve uh, Angelinos. And um, I can be more specific if you want about sort of the goals that we're, we're um, that we think about, but you know, as you like. I know. Yeah, thanks for that for that introduction. Um, your comment on on there being 100 consulates in Los Angeles is is striking to me. I usually think about diplomacy as something that has, happens in national capitals. That um, if you're going to be around diplomats, you're going to be in the capital of the country. That sounds like that's um, absolutely not the case uh, in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I I you know talk to diplomats locally, you know, every week if not every day, and they are really vital partners to us. Um, I met just as an example the new uh, Irish Consul General uh, yesterday. They set up a, a consulate here um, a few years ago, right before COVID. Um, and uh, but yeah, they they are you know an essential you know part of our city. We're and we're lucky to have them. Uh, I mean, Los Angeles has a uniquely large consular corps. I think they tell me it's the third largest in the world. Um, so, so that is unique to Los Angeles. But there are consulates, you know, in many other cities in the United States as well. And they're they're important partners to us. Right, right. So you are um, in in close contact with uh, national representatives from other other countries. How about um, being in touch with uh, representatives of cities in, in other parts of the world, or maybe especially across the Pacific? Can you tell us, I guess under COVID, the, the travel aspect of diplomacy is, is a bit dampened, but perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how that uh, city to city outreach works. Yeah, there's a lot of that um, as well. And um, that can be bilateral uh, and it can also be multilateral. So in other words, it can be you know, us talking to one other city to do something in particular, but it's also that we're part of city networks. So, um, for for example, the mayor uh, for another month or so is chair of the C40, which is this very large um, network of about 100 mega cities in the world, all pledging to reduce their carbon emissions. And uh, the mayor last week in Glasgow brought the biggest non-nation pledge. Uh, to COP so of a thousand cities, so not not even just the network, but a thousand cities um, that are all pledging to reduce their carbon emissions by half by uh, 2030, and then net zero by 2050. And we, Los Angeles is on track to do that, but Seoul is as well. Seoul is one of the members of the C40 uh, network cities. So is Tokyo. Um, so is Jakarta. Um, so is Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and many others uh, in Asia. So that's a really key um, priority of Los Angeles's international diplomacy is, is climate. Um, we also started a network for gender equity of cities. So we are working with uh, Tokyo and London and Freetown in Sierra Leone and uh, Mexico City and Barcelona and Buenos Aires. Uh, so some of them are Pacific Rim. Um, that are looking at how cities can um, reduce uh, or, or increase, I should say, gender equity. Um, and we're, we're doing it in all different ways. And so uh, we'll be publishing a toolkit later this, this uh, month that other cities can use if they, they're trying to tackle this, this problem. And you know, I never worked at a city level before, but it turns out there are lots of uh, influence that cities can have on the lives of women and, and girls. Um, uh, in terms of public safety and in terms of transportation and, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, education and leadership opportunities. So that's, uh, that's another just example. Um, but we also just talk to cities, you know, individually sometimes to learn lessons about particular things or to offer our own lessons and our own experiences. Um, we did that a lot during COVID.
No, that's um, that's fascinating. I think it, it makes sense, you know, in an, in an era of globalization that we have these international ties that uh, we cannot imagine them happening only at a national level, that they're that they are crisscrossing at, at all sorts of local levels as well. So I can understand um, the the opportunity presented by having these sorts of, of dialogues. And uh, you mentioned on the issue of gender equity, there are specific things that uh, cities can do, especially perhaps in a more decentralized system like like the United States in, in education and transport. Could you say something about, about climate um, in that regard? Um, most of what we're hearing from, from Glasgow is, is about national government. So it's really fascinating to hear that um, there is this city contingent with LA at, uh, at the center. What is, it, what is it specifically about cities that makes them um, well placed to make a real contribution in, in this area of climate change or, or reducing carbon emissions. This is another uh, uh, you know subject that's been in education for me. Uh, cities have some really important levers um, for for climate change. So um, in our case, we own our own utility. So that right there is power generation, right? That's extremely important, and um, we're on track to be 100% renewable on our grid by 2035, so pretty quick, and it'll be around 97% by 2030. Um, so that's one example. Another is uh, ports, which um, are sources of carbon, and you know all the electrification we've done around um, our port to reduce um, pollution, um, but also to you know to to address climate change. Building codes are another thing that cities control and bu buildings are another big emitter of carbon. Um, transportation is a huge one, right? So we are putting in all these rail lines in Los Angeles and we have more uh, installed electric chargers than any other city in the United States. Um, we are making our bus fleet go electric. Um, so that's you know another gigantic piece of the puzzle. Um, and uh, and finally, waste and sanitation is 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 another another thing that mostly cities handle, and that can also contribute to climate change, um, depending on how you process your waste. And um, in LA, water, you know, this is more kind of adaptation than it is mitigation. But you know, we have to uh, really conserve water, and so uh, Mayor Garcetti has um, pledged that we will, you know, we will. Um, recycle like 100% of our water by, I'm not sure exactly, 2040, I think is the date, but I might have that quite, not quite right. Um, but this is all part of um, a Green New Deal that Los Angeles um, has, that Mayor Garcetti has pushed forward. So we have these very aggressive climate ambitions and they are, they are, and we're not alone at all in that, right? So there are cities all around the world and many in the United States as well that are, that um that have these tools and can actually implement you know that's um it, you know depending on the national government a lot of times they have to rely on local partners to actually make the make the programs work um and that's what you know that's what we do In, yeah interesting right so that's it's good to hear this um uh, kind of uplifting story uh on on climate change here uh, and, and to hear about it at the city level, sometimes we may think about national governments and the regulations they can put in and, and how that can contribute to uh, alleviating climate change. But the things you're talking about, about municipal services and control over energy and, and so on, you're, you're right, this seems to lead to um, really direct impacts. Well, let me say, though, that I, you know, we shouldn't diminish the role of, of national governments. I mean, especially in terms of funding, if we didn't, you know, if we didn't, like, for example, this where I said that we're going to be net um, like 100 percent renewable energy on our grid by 2035. We know that because we did a um, there was a national the national lab, a national renewable energy lab did uh, millions of uh, um, permutations of various ways that we could get there and came up with some plans for us. So that was a, an example of a collaboration that occurred. And that was even under the Trump administration and under the Biden administration, you know, this, all this, um, you know, as part of the, 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 the bipartisan infrastructure plan, like that money will, and, and those opportunities will come to us and we'll be able to accelerate even further. So it's really critical to have the national peace. But I will say that during the Trump administration, for those four years when 
you know, nothing was really happening uh, at the national level in terms of reducing climate change. I mean, quite the opposite. It was cities that carried on, right? So we had 400 city, more than 400 cities, I think 450 by now, um, called climate mayors, which were cities that said that, that, you know, if the United States is going to leave the Paris Accord, we're still going to abide by, by its, um, by its mandates and its goals. So it it makes it means that now that we have a new national government coming in with, you know, it's really putting climate front and center, they're not starting from zero. They're, you know, we cities and states have been carrying out this work. And California, the state deserves a lot of credit too for for its um for its you know regulations and its um uh its commitment uh, through infrastructure to you know to to a reduced carbon economy. The, the interaction you describe between uh, federal government and the local government sounds quite complex. So, so the support from, uh, from Washington is, is crucial to help uh, local initiatives be uh, seen through to implementation. But it sounds like you're also saying that it's um, not exclusively dependent on that, that there are things that can be, can be done uh, at, at the local level. And then when the opportunity is, is right at the federal level, um, things can can happen much faster. Yeah, that's, oh, that's, right. that's interesting. Uh, maybe we can continue with this this theme of um, uh, central and and local relations. So so there's this discussion of possible of possible creation of an office of subnational diplomacy. Uh, I think under the State Department. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about about what this means? If it's un unusual and how it might support uh, what offices such as yours are, are doing. Sure. Um, yeah, there's legislation, bipartisan legislation, to create such an office in this in the State Department. There was something a little bit like it during the um, during the time that uh, Secretary Clinton was uh, was the Secretary of State. Um, uh, Rita Jo Lewis ran it at that point with a small team. But basically, um, what the office would do would be a few things. Like first of all inform cities um, who have questions about an international engagement, for example. Um, it would, you know, coordinate uh, if there's like a head of state visiting and, you know, we, and we're lucky in LA, they, you know, we've, we've hosted many heads of state. Um, and I, I happen to, you know, either um, have the knowledge because of my previous career or know people who I can call to, you know, to find out you know what the what the U.S. policy is, but that's not true of most cities uh, and states. And then, you know, if there's a relationship that is particularly important um, to you know to the United States, that office could suggest that cities and states, uh, you know, develop relationships with the, with the subnational um, folks. Uh, but I guess for two reasons, I, I I think it should happen. One is that you know, cities and cities um, and states in the United States are we're just we're out there doing it, and it would probably be good for the State Department to know, you know, <laughs> to have some sense of what we're doing and how they could capitalize on it, for example. Um, and then there's other other uh, countries, um, including, you know, uh, uh, countries that are not so friendly to our interests are are doing this exact same thing. Um, China is very um, aggressive with its subnational diplomacy strategy. Um, and I, I, you know, subnational is a very wonky term. Diplomacy is kind of a wonky term, but basically this is, you know, cities and states or provinces, um, uh, you know, making deals or, um, you know, uh, creating programs and exchanges and whatever at the, at the you know, the subnational level. So, um, so that's another reason why I think you know, the United States and, and the values of cities, I think that's another important piece of this, of, of city diplomacy is, you know, promoting our values um, uh, of diversity and inclusion and of um, equity and, uh, you know, of, of welcoming uh, um, partnerships, you know, with foreign partners and, you know, with countries and cities, et cetera. Um, uh, and so, that's another reason why I think we we should encourage you know cities and states to um, to continue to you know to to build up their relationships. I'll tell you, I mean, the reason what we think about in our in our uh, shop is a few goals. So one is to create jobs. 
So to be very practical about this, you know, if we're attracting um, foreign investors or businesses or nonprofits to set up in Los Angeles and create jobs here, like that's a great thing to help small businesses export is another thing that we try to make sure um, that they get the right training for that to happen. We, um, we're, we have a focus on young people in LA and bringing them international skills and experiences. So pre-COVID, we sent um, about 130 community college students um, overseas on their first trips to about seven countries. For many of them, it was their first time on an airplane. Uh, and, you know, those were life-changing experiences for many of those, um, of those students. Um, we also, you know, we've touched on this, try to solve global problems that affect Los Angeles. So climate and, and, um, and gender equity we talked about, but, um, that's also true of COVID was a really global challenge that we, that we, you know, often talk to other cities about. Um, and migration is another one where we are founding members of the Mayor's Migration Council. Um, and then finally, we, you know, we support, we try to support these big diaspora communities that are in Los Angeles. Um, and they, that could be the, for cultural events. It could be for exchanges. You know, it could also be for, um, you know, political reasons that they want to know, you know, what is going on. Um, if there's something, you know, distressing happening in their country, what can we do about it? You know, can we can we talk to the White House or the State Department about it? And um, so that's another another function that we that we serve. Um, and these days, I don't think. I mean, it seems like pretty much every week I'm we're, I'm talking to the to the National Security Council or the State Department. Right. So, so there's a, a number of these really important international uh, dimensions to um, to cities now. It seems uh, when I when I hear a term like city diplomacy, which is uh, which is one that comes up now, um, I think about things like sister cities. But what you're describing seems to go well beyond uh, sort of sister city relationships. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we have a lot of sister cities, Los Angeles does, I think 27. Um, and there's a separate organization called Sister Cities of Los Angeles that, you know, manages the, many of those relationships. But but um, but they're important, you know, because they they speak to a long history. Um, I went uh, Busan in, in South Korea, is our sister city and sister port. Um, we have Nagoya in Japan is one, Jakarta is another. Um, and they... Uh, um, they, you know, they're often kind of a group, groups of people in the city that really, you know, feel very strongly about that relationship and support it. And, uh, and we, you know, we try to work with them to do the same. Um, but they do provide a, a kind of a nice foundation of history, uh, to build upon. So some of the work we do is with our sister cities and, and I'm, as I've described, some of it isn't. Um, but, but that is, you know, when I advise other cities, you know, or other um, individuals from other cities in the United States sort of where to start, that's usually where, you know, something I suggest is if they have sister cities to, you know, to start with, start there and find out what more they can do to add on, whether it's sort of a technical assistance sharing or trade missions or, um, you know, particular problem solving. Uh, I remember actually early on, you know, Mexico City is another of our sister cities and we celebrated a big, uh, a big milestone of the 50th um, a few years ago. But before that, we had been working on um, earthquakes together. And, you know, Mexico City had this earthquake early warning system that inspired LA to, to set up our own earthquake early warning system. And now all of California has that, say, that has that, um, has that in place. And just so your audience knows, it's called My Shake. Uh, my shake is the name of the app, which everyone in California should download and use. <laughs> yeah, interesting. That's very practical. Yeah, very practical um, kind of kinds of knowledge to share, isn't it? Um, on on yeah, issues but like. Yeah, but again, like if you have this relationship and you you know you know the know the folks on the other side, uh, because of a sister city relationship, you can build on and do other things. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Interesting. When I when I hear when I hear terms like subnational diplomacy, it also makes me think um, more about uh, maybe in the Asian region about neighboring countries, about kind of fringes of neighboring countries 
um, that have special relationships, maybe close economic ties between a couple of provinces that are adjacent or conflicts uh, such as between uh, the Far East of Russia and, and, and Northern Japan. Um, but what you're describing is, is on a much more global scale, I think, to, um, to what I'm associating with, uh, with sub, subnational diplomacy. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, but because of our geography, um, we, you know, we care a lot about our, our relationship with uh, Canada and Mexico, for example. And we, um, there came a point in during the Trump administration where our relationship with Mexico was really at the national level, um, uh, not, you know, not um, going smoothly. Um, mm -hmm. Was not particularly friendly, and we stood up a. Um, a commission um, with Mexico, so it's a Mex. It was a national city initiative called Mexla, where we had 15 um, uh, leaders on both sides um, brought together to have conversations about um, projects and practical ideas that that we could share together. Um, and you know that was something that uh, our large Mexican diaspora, you know, appreciated. We worked with the Mexican consulate as well. Um, but that's more, maybe more of an example of what you're talking about, where proximity that made a big difference. But the fact is, in LA, you know, we have people from everywhere, um, from all over, yeah. uh, and you know, maybe more so uh, Asian and Latin American. Yeah. Um, but we have lots of Europeans here as well. Um, so, um, and the UK is actually one of our top investors. Uh, so it, you know, it is, it is also happening at a global scale. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's fascinating the examples you give on climate change and on uh, relations with uh, with Mexico. You're you're showing ways that relationships built at at the city city level can help tide over uh, periods of difficulty at uh, at a national level, perhaps. And that that's um, that's nice to hear that uh, hear that story. You know, and, and the, talking about sister cities also makes me think about uh, potential roles for other people in uh, a city like Los Angeles for playing. Uh, uh, doing something for city diplomacy. Are there roles for other civic organizations or people with with an international bent uh, to get involved in in this? Oh yeah, I mean we work with partners all the time. You know we're a very small office, so there's not much we can do, um, you know, just on our own. But um, you know, our for the, the the program I described for community college, you know, we were in close um, you know close partnership with the community college system. Um, really, with everything that we do, we are we are partnering with someone or another. Um, so yeah, absolutely, and we're always open to to new ideas. Also, I should say, and I'm sure your audience uh, is a you know it has some uh, and would be a, you know a great uh, could be a great resource for us. So um, uh, you know we're we're coming. Um, well, our mayor is going to be going off to be the um, ambassador to India once confirmed, um, which in and of itself speaks to his really global vision, uh, which is what has made, you know, our office and our work possible was was because of that. Um, uh, but, you know, we uh, I think no matter who the next mayor is, there will be a lot of global activity happening in, you know, in Los Angeles. And uh, I really urge your your listeners to uh, to get involved and to and to start things that we don't have, because for such a global city, there's lots of things, uh, lots of institutions that L.A. doesn't have. Um, and so, you know, either recruiting them to come here or starting them ourselves, I think we need to do. We don't have as rich uh, an ecosystem of institutions as I would like, and obviously World Affairs Council Town Hall is <laughs> is an exception to that rule, and one of the really important ones that we have, uh, and Rand is another important one that we have. But um, if you compare us to East Coast cities or even to San Francisco, we do, we don't have quite the density that I would like for the second largest city in the United States and for such a global city. Uh, so I welcome I welcome ideas. Good. That's that's uh, that's a good call out to to ho to some of our viewers here. Um, so you have this this experience in uh, diplomacy at the national level, and then now you're bringing it to to the city level. Can you tell us perhaps a little bit about about how your experience um, at the the national level as uh, as a State Department diplomat um, 
kind of prepared you for this role or how it's different in the role you're doing now to what you did uh, previously. I think you have this unique experience. And so it's a good chance for our listeners to, to learn something here. Yeah, uh, I think it was a good preparation because I, you know, have a, I came into the job with a general knowledge of how, you know, countries relate to one another and, and what the, you know, what the bureaucracy looks like. So I can, I know who to call if I have questions, um, for example. Um, but at the same time, what I didn't know was city government, and that took me a while to learn how the city, how the city operates. Um, and you know, our role is new. Um, so also, you know, trying to convey like the value that we bring was an important piece as well, because you know, we've just never existed before that an office like like mine. Um, I really like how practical it is. I love that cities are all about solving problems and, you know, making things better for residents and that it's this discrete group of people um, because then, you know, I, uh, you know, we, we take our cues from what the priorities of the mayor are, but also what of our, of our residents are. Uh, so it's different in that way. Um, and it is just more practical, you know, and obviously we don't have any, you know, um, jurisdiction over national security or over trade rules. Um, we can, we, we are not um, obliged to have full relationships with any one country or city where we have to agree on all the issues or we can just pick the issues that where we do agree and where we want to do more together. Um, and that I think uh, gets us a lot of you know flexibility um, and uh, and freedom that is not always there at the national level. Yeah, I can I, I can imagine that, and I, I can also imagine based on what you're saying uh, again the, the how useful it would be to have a little bit more uh, coordination from uh, from the center as well. I can I can imagine it could get uh, it, it's nice to talk about areas of uh, committed cooperation and agreement, but it it must also be sometimes, at least with some dealing with cities in some parts of the world, difficult to segment those to to separate those um, from the sticky sticky issues. I mean, if you're if uh, an office like yours is able to do that, I think that's um, a really positive story that we don't hear enough about today. I think we hear a lot about um, with with certain uh, other countries growing growing suspicion or animosity, um, but. If, if there are dialogues going on at subnational levels and, and areas of cooperation, I think that, that that sounds important to to underscore. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because um, there are some countries uh, where the cities are carrying the party line from the national government no matter what. Um, and so we're, we're part of this group called the U20, the Urban 20, which is the, um, the urban arm or, or urban partner, I should say, of the G20, which are the top, you know, uh, 20 economies in the world, and President Biden was just in Italy at the G20 meeting. Um, the Urban 20 is a group of uh, cities, large cities from those countries, and um, you know, we negotiate our own kind of, you know, communicate documents saying what our priorities are, and. Um, they tend to be more progressive, I would say, in general than than our nations are. Um, but we have the similar um, challenges with Beijing and Moscow, for example, not wanting to sign on to the to the strict climate uh, uh, language that the rest of the of the cities wanted to have. Um, so in that sense, it it you know it, it does mirror what happens at the national level. Um, but then, you know, I'm also uh, in conversation with cities in Eastern Europe who are, you know, really trying hard to preserve LGBTQ rights and climate action and um, other kinds of civil liberties in the face of national governments that are trying to reduce their space and, um, and you know, curtail those liberties. Uh, and they have created this thing called the Pact of Free Cities, which we, which we are, which we support, um, which is, you know, a group of cities that are um, basically, you know, striving for democracy and for and for rule of law and for individual rights, uh, and 
you know, and, and many of them in, the, like I said, in the face of these author increasingly authoritarian leaning governments. So that's another really interesting space that cities can find themselves in. Um, and in their case, uh, on the climate, uh, on the climate agenda, they are trying to reach above their national governments to the EU to get the EU to you know, create a fund that they can access directly because if they go through national governments, they'll never get anything for climate change. So um, it's just another interesting phenomenon um, where at the national government, you know, dealing with Hungary is <laughs> a challenge or, or Poland or, you know, uh, but, um, but, that, but it's easier when you're, when you're just dealing city to city because we have, we have right. our values are aligned. Interesting. That's interesting. Um, we want to turn to questions soon, but let me ask two before we get uh, questions from the audience. Let me just um, ask a couple of more questions. Um, if we have, maybe we have among our listeners some pe young people who are aspiring to to work in diplomacy in some way. And um, when I was a student, the, we imagined that as something that goes through through national governments. Uh, do you think, are there pathways to kind of international careers of service that go more through cities cities these days? Yeah, I, there are. Um, I mean, at the moment, there are not a ton of, avail you know, of, uh, of cities or of positions, but I hope that changes over time. Um, and uh, I think it's a really rewarding career that can, that can come either you know, from doing foreign policy and then coming to a city or doing, you know, domestic city policy on something else and then transitioning to, um, to working on international relations. So, you know, it can, it can, it can, you can come to that from both, um, you know, from, from two different ways. Um, but, you know, the, so anyway, I hope it grows because there are at the end of the day, not that many you know, positions right now. Um, and I certainly hope that that changes over time. Right, right. No, this um, this uh, vision you're describing of, of city-based transnational connections really, I mean, it really speaks to me personally in terms of how I think about uh, myself and how, how I've moved around the world. I've lived in, in, in big cities. I've lived in Seoul, in Singapore for a long time, in parts of Sweden and in Seattle in the U.S. where I, I mostly grew up. And when I think about those experiences, I don't think about them exclusively as national ones. Uh, a lot of a lot of those experiences are very much local. And even though I would be traveling a lot, it was between specific local places in different parts of the world. So, so what you're describing really really fits with with the map I, I kind of imagine for for myself as well. Yeah, the mayor is very eloquent on the subject, and I and I will never capture his eloquence, but. Uh, but Mayor Garcetti talks about how, you know, cities are kind of the, the only natural political entity that people are in cities because they want to be, not because of an artificial line that's mm -hmm. been drawn. Uh, and, um, the, and cities are also where, where things actually have to happen, like cities actually have to work, you know, that and, and I have, you know, undying respect for my colleagues who are working on tough issues. Like homelessness and public safety and um, you know racial justice and equity and all you know these are you know giant challenges and you know this the city has to make it work we have to um, pave the roads and take out the trash and you know keep the parks clean and make sure the libraries are open and you know make sure people have daycare and there's just a it's kind of tremendous, um, and uh, and and it is really very inspiring. Uh, the kind of people that I work with, they're amazing. Right. Let me ask uh, one final question before we turn to uh, to the audience, um, and this will sort of bring us back to uh, a little more specifically to Asia and to Seoul. Um, in as I as we started with in uh, Seoul and Los Angeles, we have two real centers of uh, innovation in cultural space in business um, and, and even in uh, you know, other initiatives related to solving or addressing global, global issues like climate or gender inequality. Can you say anything about how you would imagine cooperation between Los Angeles and another center of innovation across the Pacific such as Seoul? I mean, are, are there particular forums that exist or could be built where experiences can be shared and there can be mutual learning? Yeah. Um... 
Well, we're, you know, it's been a little bit of a transition period, sadly, in Seoul as they lost their last mayor and, you know, have a new, have a new mayor, you know, relatively recently. Um, but we have, you know, we went to visit Seoul on our, on our trade mission and went to see uh, the very impressive uh, offices of the mayor there with, you know, this incredible uh, map of, of the city and kind of with things happening in real time, uh, which I think was pretty inspiring. Uh, and um, Seoul and, and Los Angeles both host forums on a pretty regular basis that each other attend. Uh, and but there's, I'm sure, kind of a wealth of of places and and ways that we can cooperate. Um, for example, we have the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, that is a public-private partnership that incubates um, companies working on um, solutions to to climate change. And you know, to the degree that Seoul has that same ecosystem, which I'm sure they do, um, because they're pretty, uh, you know, aggressive on climate goals, like connecting them would be, you know, the kind of thing that we, that we do on a regular, you know, on a regular basis. Uh, and I'll say that the consulate here is wonderful and very engaged. Um, also, we're, we're very lucky um, to have them. Great. Okay. Thank you for those, uh, those remarks. Let's um, let's maybe turn back over to Jessica and see if she can help us with some questions from from the audience. Great, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm trying to get my computer fired up here because it's giving me some audio issues. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, well, let me see if my, my camera will come on in a moment. Uh, the first question we have here in terms of global influence. I would posit that London and Britain has an outsized influence on the world. Does Los Angeles have a liaison in Mayor Khan's office? Oh, yes. We work with London all the time, and they are a great team. They, um, they were a founding member of the gender equity uh, network that I talked about earlier. Um, Mayor Khan and Mayor Garcetti talk all the time as well um, uh, as C40. In fact, Mayor Garcetti is is um, handing over the, the chair of, of C42 Mayor Khan, um, and uh, and we share we shared a lot during COVID as well of our of our different kinds of initiatives. So um, yes, is the answer. We are we've been we're I, I agree with you, and we're we're not only close to London, we're also close to the UK. I would say they have been. Um, oh, the other actual area, first of all, for London is on the games. Um, you know, we're going to be hosting the 2028 games and um, are taking, you know, some some ideas from London about um, especially business attraction, which they did so successfully in the lead up to the to the games. And that's something that we would like to, to emulate. Um, and then in terms of the UK, we have a variety, you know, the, the there's a relatively new um, consul general here who is wonderful. And um, we have you know, a variety of cooperation with them around mobility um, and, uh, and and mobility entrepreneurship, um, sustainable mobility entrepreneurship, I guess I should say. Um, so uh, yes, is the, is the short answer. What did Angelinos gain from the city participating in international diplomatic networks and international diplomacy more generally? Good question. Um, so I'll give you a few um, examples. Um, let me start with the, most, the, the more amorphous one. Uh, actually, let me start with the more concrete one. So jobs would be one. Um, so as we work to attract companies to locate in Los Angeles, they will hire locally. So that's one. Um, or what, if we're helping a small business export, that can also create jobs on this end. So that's, that's that. Um, we, you know, for a group of young people, we help to expose them to international affairs through those trips as I was talking about. World Affairs Council has given those uh, graduates um, membership in the World Affairs Council so that they can continue their international education. We've paired consulates and high schools as well, um, which was a program we did you know, also pre-COVID. Um, so that's you know another example. And then there's a ton of like culture and film festivals and um uh art shows and national days and food and uh so there's that whole realm of things um there's ideas that make our city better that we get from other places 
um, for example. Uh, and I can give you a specific example that the mayor was talking to the mayor of Bogota um, and they have a really extensive gondola system and we're, uh, we have a company in LA that wants to um, have build a gondola from Union Station to Dodger Stadium. So learning from Bogota how, you know, how you do that right, how you do that best is something that we can, that we can pursue. I, I gave the earthquake example earlier. So that's kind of in the realm of, of ideas and, and problem solving. And then I would say as well that when Los Angeles leads, we can make a dent even in world problems. And I think the best example of that is climate, where if it weren't for the mayor, Mayor Garcetti saying, I want a thousand cities to bring to COP, there wouldn't be a thousand cities going to COP and making that pledge. And that makes an actual dent in, in, our, in our trajectory on climate change. When you have enough cities doing something together, it can actually move the needle in an international way. Never a substitute for national action, never a substitute for what all the countries in the world need to be pledging and doing, but it can actually make a difference. So um, those are some examples. Thank you. So this is kind of a broad question, but what can we expect now that the mayor is heading to India? Expect in city government, maybe? Well, there'll be an, you know, once Perhaps. he is confirmed by the Senate, um, he will, uh, you know, there, there's a little bit more rig and roll and then he'll go out to post. Um, there'll be an acting mayor uh, who will be the president of the city council, Nuri Martinez, and then they will, I understand, appoint an interim mayor, and then there will be next year an election, um, a primary in June, and then the election in November for the, the next mayor. And interestingly, the mayor has already served kind of beyond the normal eight years. His He got an extra year and, a, and, a, and change um, because they moved the election date to coincide with uh, with big elections, um, so uh, so we're in, we're in kind of wonderful Eric Garcetti bonus time. But uh, but that's that's sort of how it will unfold. Thank you. Subnational diplomacy is kind of a niche field of practice at this point in time for young people interested in pursuing a career in city level or subnational diplomacy. How would you recommend they gain relevant experience? Should they pursue jobs in the State Department, international development organizations, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. It is kind of a small field right now, um, as I as I said earlier. So I would say there's a there's a bunch of different ways. So you can work for a city and then make your way toward doing more international work in the city, either as you know part of of another job that you're doing or you know transition to that. Um, another way is to get international experience, and that can be through that can be development agencies, can be NGOs, it can be the State Department, um, uh, and then and then you know look around for city jobs, uh, you know after you've had that. So I think either either way can can work. Um, when I'm looking at a resume, I'm sort of checking that there really is a deep international interest and ideally experience. There's also, you know, someone who is practical and who has some experience just get getting things done. Because at a city level, that's really um, the premium is is on, you know, being able to manage a, a project through a process and and realize, you know, goals on the other side. Thank you. Um, can you discuss any cooperation with other major cities regarding the supply chain crisis? Yeah, um, I know that our port is in great constant communication with other ports around the world. Um, and uh, we, um, so I would just say that, that I know that they are um, extremely um, tied in with other ports that are trying to manage this as well. Um, and you saw the Biden administration, um, you know, offering support to the port of Los Angeles also. Um, we there. We are also um, have been asked by the Biden administration to be one of uh, four ports for a quad port green port initiative. So um, this is uh, not active at the very moment. I think we need to get through the <laughs> supply chain crisis first. 
but um, but our port's very green by port standards. Um, uh, for example, we require ships to plug in when they come into dock as opposed to just running their diesel, dirty diesel engines um, and a hundred other things uh, that I could not bore you with. But um, so we are, we are in partnership with Sydney and Mumbai and Yokohama, which are the ports chosen by the other four nations that are part of what's called the Quad. Um, so that's you know, India and Australia and Japan and the United States. Um, so that's another um, example. But when I, you know, when I talk to the port about about this quad initiative, you know, they have relationships with all with with basically all the ports because we're we're a very big port and also a um, you know a, a technologically savvy one. Um, Singapore it has incredible ports as well. You've mentioned the very large diasporas exist in Los Angeles. Could you please tell us a little about the fine line that elected city officials or your office need to walk in those instances when the sentiments of the local diasporas or portions thereof are not necessarily in sync with the foreign policy goals or the national interests of the US? What are the challenges and what takes priority? That is a, such an excellent question. Um, and I don't feel like I've really had a clear instance of that, actually. I mean, I'm sure that there, which I can completely imagine that, but I haven't, I haven't really had to encounter that yet. Um, and, you know, we don't control US foreign policy, obviously, right? So, um, and I, I don't know that we would, uh, well, that's not true. Anyway, what I was going to say is I don't think we have really the ability to mess it up, but we probably could if we really tried. But but I, you know, I work for the United States, and and I, um, and I wouldn't do that. Uh, but what I have encountered instances of is diaspora populations with great hostility toward each other because of what's happening in. Um, uh, you know, in their in their countries of origin or their their countries of, of heritage, and um, you know that that can be tense. And um, but we in the city, um, you know, have experience in dealing with this. You know, with the the, the general condition of when populations are um, hostile toward each other, and so we have we have tools that we can use to try to diffuse tension and bring people together. Um, so that that I've encountered, but haven't yet, um, you know, encountered the scenario. But I'm going to think about that and and try to uh, you know game out how it would go. Great. Uh, Los Angeles is well known for its innovation and creativeness. Does your office have any project plans regarding this? Um. Well, I do think that our creative industries are one of our you know, are just a shining global example of, uh, of what we do. And they are one of the more global industries. Um, we will be uh, launching a new effort toward foreign direct investment, toward telling LA's full story. Um, I think people know well about, um, you know, our movie industry, but they, they don't know as much about um, our you know, digital tech um, uh, side of things and, and our digital entertainment and esports, um, as well as sustainability and mobility and advanced manufacturing and space and aerospace and these other sectors that we're less known for. Um, in, you know, in general, uh, there are other parts of the mayor's office that work with creative industries um, and lobby for tax credits to film in, in LA and things like that, um, which which have which are great right now. Um, so and we do you know we connect with other innovation centers around the world uh, to you know share our share our you know our and have our entrepreneurs talk to each other. Um, so. You know, it's 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 almost a hard question to answer because it's just in the air in Los Angeles, the the innovation and the creativity. So I, I think as city governments go, we're 
we're pretty innovative and creative. Uh, you know, even in even in the government, we've we've gotten some awards for that. So uh, I hope that answers it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does the city of Los Angeles have overseas offices or liaisons in Asia? No, I can only can only wish that we had that, but no, we don't. We do though. Our tourism department does have have foreign offices, um, and they focus really on just you know. Then they do a great job of attracting tourists to to LA because um, the foreign segment of our tourism population is the fastest growing. So they do have overseas offices, but the city of LA does not. Thank you. In the themes, of, uh, in the terms of State Department and relations with the federal government, can you describe how your office works with the Office of Foreign Missions, Los Angeles Regional Office? Yeah, um, we have a really lovely relationship with them. They're a great group of people, and um, we, you know, we coordinate um, in certain circumstances more than others. I mean, sometimes we'll just ask them a question if we can't track something down, and they'll help us track it down. Um, sometimes, uh, if we have like a a head of state visit or um, some, you know, uh, sticky diplomatic situation, we will we will coordinate with them. I mean, their job is really to work with the consulates uh, that are here and, you know, um, you know, guide them and make sure they are they have what they need from the State Department. But um, but they're terrific and um, and and we yeah, work with them, you know, fairly regularly. I'm putting back your ambassador hat on again. What major insights can you give us about ASEAN's role in the global arena, and especially with respect to U.S. versus China? Oh my gosh, what a big question. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, ASEAN is, you know, a group of ten smallish countries. Indonesia is not that small, but um, they're it's incredibly diverse. Um, it has a population of around 650 million people, um, and in terms of our the the U.S. relationship with them, I think the fact that we have lots of familial ties, lots of economic ties, that um, that you know their major exports from the United States, uh, you know, go to them. They share our interest in a rules based. Uh, open international system um, and that's really important um, and uh, and we have you know um, they, they've created stability in a region by just agreeing with each other not to go to war to solve their disputes and that has made them grow very rapidly so uh, you know in terms of the, our relationship with China or their relationship with China they really as a group, want to be friends with everybody, and they don't want to choose. Um, they really want the United States, United States's engagement, um, but they also, you know, are many of them. Uh, China is their largest trading partner. They also work with Japan and Korea and Australia and New Zealand um, and the EU, and they want to have all those relationships also. Um, but I do. Think that they are a stabilizing force. They host these major uh, meetings every year, uh, where all the big powers and ASEAN countries get together to discuss important security and economic issues. Um, and none, none of the other countries can really do that. Like none of the other countries can host those meetings and have it be on kind of neutral enough territory that everyone else will come. So. Um, they play a really important role, in my view, in uh, in the in the Indo-Pacific. Well, thank you so much. I know we're almost at the end of the hour, so I just wanted to turn this back over to Eric and to you. If you have any closing remarks or information on how our audience can get in touch with you if they want to help to uh, lead the charge on some of these international programs, so go ahead. Sure. Well, I've really enjoyed this, uh, and the address is mayor.international at lacity.org. Um, and we have a newsletter you can sign up for as well if you're interested. Um, and we're always looking for you know good ideas and would love any feedback that you have about what you've heard today. And uh, you know I feel very lucky to have this job. Really lucky to to serve Los Angeles. Yeah. So uh, thanks so much, uh, Ambassador Hashigian, uh, and thanks to the Korea Foundation for their support in this event. I think the issue is. 
uh, is really timely. Um, uh, I think it's a spe of a special relevance in a place like Seoul. This is a city that uh, has had international connections for a long time, but has kind of grown into a local identity in the last 10 to 15 years with a lot of emphasis on uh, community engagement, kinds of things that um, uh, Ambassador Hashigin would have seen when she visited uh, City Hall in, in Seoul. Um, so I think there, there uh, is a lot of opportunity there as well. I've learned a lot uh, today about what city diplomacy is, uh, about what this new office does, I've learned about how it uh, helps us to address global challenges like climate change and gender equity, among others, and also serve uh, the local population in their in their concrete needs because of this uh, practical slant to to city government. Uh, so thanks very much uh, again, Ambassador Hashigian, uh, for being with us today, and thanks to the audience as well. Thank you. And on thank behalf you. of the council, again, thank you so much, Ambassador Hashigian, for all of your insight. And our, our city is really lucky to have you. So thank you again. And to Eric, I know you'll be arriving in Los Angeles shortly. So we look forward to working with you more going forward. Um, as Eric mentioned, thank you again to the Korea Foundation for their support of today's program and to all of you for joining us today. If you'd like to support the council and programs like these and to learn about our upcoming events and membership, please visit our website at lawact.org. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you so much.